Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm Shakia. I want to welcome everyone to our debut Ballpark Figures. Um, I'm so excited to be here, so excited about our guests. Really pumped that all of you are here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, Shakia Taylor, Curly Fro on Twitter, a little bit of dope on Instagram. Um, and uh, looking forward to uh, spending the next little bit with you. Uh, but first, let's get an announcement out of the way. Um, <clears throat> it's an exciting time for Sabre right now. Our annual Sabre Day celebration is coming up this weekend, and we encourage all baseball fans to attend. More than 20 Sabre Day events are planned for this Saturday, February 5th, some online and some in person, with guest speakers from around the baseball world. Please check out the events at sabre.org for complete details on a Sabre Day event near you. Um, I know a lot of people here are also not Sabre members, so let me make a pitch real quick. Join. I mean, I'm here, so it doesn't get any cooler than that, right? Um, and <laughs> now I want to welcome Coach Roger Kador from Southern University. Coach, I feel like I don't even need to do too much to introduce you. You're a legend. How are you? Oh, oh, as I used to say to people, all legends are dead but I'm happy to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. <laughs> it's um, a pleasure, Shakia. Thanks, I'm so so excited to see you, of course. Um, so let's talk, let's talk about your baseball career before coaching. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, my baseball career is a, a little unique in that if you go back to, to high school, uh, I didn't play Little League. I didn't, I didn't play baseball until I was 15 years old. I didn't start playing basketball until I was 13 years old. I grew up in the South on a farm, a son of a sharecropper. Uh, you had to work. You didn't get to do athletics. And we very rarely went to school. And finally, I convinced my dad that I wanted to go to school. And he let me. And then I started playing basketball at 13. And then at 15, I started playing baseball and uh, ended up getting a basketball scholarship to Southern University and ended up playing baseball and basketball and ended up being drafted by the Atlanta Braves in the 10th round. So I was a, a fortunate person who got an extremely late start in life. Today, this could never happen. Someone started playing sports at 13, 14, and 15. They would not be able to deal with the tremendous amount of failure and everybody today wants things to be a microwave situation quickly yeah. and, you know, and, but I took it in stride. I didn't enjoy a lot of success, but someone saw something in me, the coaches, and they were patient and they gave me the time to get better. And I worked hard because I, in my heart, I knew that uh, I had not had the opportunity. And, I, you know, the one thing, the system had dealt me a bad card, a bad deck, a bad hand. They mm -hmm. dealt, the system in the South had dealt me, dealt me a bad hand. They discriminated, they denied me an education, but I didn't use that as a crutch or an excuse. I found a way to make it work and it got better. So, you know, many young people today wouldn't do that. They would just say they didn't do this. But I had to find a way to make it because I didn't want to go back to what my father was doing because that was not what I was all about. Yeah. Um, how did you end up at Southern? How did you end up as a coach at Southern, I should say? <laughs> it was, I, it was a, as weird as it could be. After I got through playing baseball with the Atlanta Braves, came and got a master's degree. And my wife, Donna, and I were about to leave Baton Rouge to go to Greenville, South Carolina, where I was going to get a job with Union Carbide. Okay. And there comes the coach who I played basketball under. And he said, I just fired two guys to hire you. And I can't use the words he said on TV. He said, you go out work both of them. And, and, and my wife at the time, Donna said, well, you know, maybe you stay a couple of years and we go. Well, a couple of years ended up being 40 years. So I coached basketball for four years as an assistant. Okay. 
And then in 1984, uh, the athletic director came to me and said, hey, we need a baseball coach. And God knows I did never want to be the baseball coach. It took him two months, two months, Shakia. And finally, one night he came and he convinced my wife that I should take the job. And she was the one person that told me I had to take the job and I took it. So that's how I became a coach. Now, the reason I didn't want to take the job is because they had no facilities, they had no equipment, but it was a tremendous a program that had a lot of history. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of it with it with Lou Brock and Danny Goodwin and a lot of guys who had been had done well. So I took the job in August of 84 with no equipment and my wife and I, we jumped in the car and we drove to Atlanta. Before I did that, I called Dusty Baker, who is a personal okay. friend of mine. We played with the Braves together, told him my situation. He was the hitting coach with the Giants then. And he said, we'll be in Atlanta, come on, we'll get all the equipment you need. What we did, jumped in the car and believe it or not, we got so much equipment, we had to U-Haul it back. I mean, UPS, sent it back UPS. So that's how we got started. And uh, from there, we had no baseball field. I was able to build a baseball field. We had no uh, dressing room. I was able to build that. And we were able to do a lot of things because I was driven beyond yeah. what normal things were. I didn't find fault. Remember, based upon my upbringing, I was denied so many things. And then when I got to Southern, it was, we were denied a lot of things in baseball. So it was easy for me to motivate myself to help the kids, the less fortunate, you got me? Mm -hmm. The one thing you never want to do with young people is complain. You never want them to see you complain. You use your, your environment, your situation, and you use it as a teaching tool, as a motivation to help them uplift themselves. And that's what I did. That's an amazing story, Coach. Um, I was gonna ask you about the grocery basket, but you covered that. I thought that was so fascinating that Dusty Baker, was it just Dusty or did the Giants help? Did any other teams help it, it out? Was dusty. It was Dusty and uh, over the years, because I played with the Brave, I was able to still go back. It was a guy, the equipment manager named Bill Acre. I was able to get stuff from him. But Dusty, even when he became manager with the Giants and the Cubs and uh, 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 Cincinnati, he always sent equipment. He always had stuff coming to me. Because I remember back in 1980, uh, uh, I had a pacemaker put in. And uh, Dusty called to check on me. My wife answered. And he, so he told us something that she shared with me. He said, I'm going to always answer Roger's call because if he called me, he's not asking for anything for himself. It's all about the kids, the boys. See, Dusty grew up in that kind of environment. He understood mm -hmm. that, that there's a coach out there who helped him. And, and he wanted to pass that along with to me so I could help those kids because he understood the plight of black kids. And all of my kids basically were hitting the city kids where they didn't have a whole lot, you got me? Yeah. But my kids love it. They love what we were doing. They love the hard work we put in. And they love the little inches that we were able to make. You see what I'm saying? Because they could see progress. Mm -hmm. They could see they never have seen before, you got me? Mm -hmm. and so that's what I love. I love my players. Um. That's actually a good place to go into. I've read that you have incredible relationships with your players, with their families. In fact, a friend of mine um, actually said that you you helped save his life, um, that he was going the wrong direction and you were there for them. How do you build those relationships uh, with the, you know, the athletes and their families? Well, you know what you got to, you know, I work with a lot of people who didn't have the sensitivity when it comes to people. They were always quick to run people off, get rid of them and do this, not help. 
And I always went the extra mile. And they, I got, I took a lot of slack about that at Southern because I would go the extra mile to help someone, you got me? To save mm-hmm. someone, if they, if that's the way you want to put it. Mm-hmm. And the reason I did it, because there was someone did it for me. I was so ill-prepared and it was people who helped me, you got me? Mm-hmm. They helped me get to the next step. Why not do the same thing for the, the less fortunate? And the Bible always said, you should always help the less fortunate. You should always help them. They're the one that needs your help. A rich person doesn't need any help. But people want to get to them because they're thinking they're going to get something <laughs> something in return. But the less right. fortunate is get your blessing from, to be honest with you. And I love the less fortunate. And we talked about it. And, uh, you know, we literally cried together and we smiled together because that's where the joy came from. That's, that's, that's beautiful. That's really amazing. You, I mean, the impact that you've made, um, not just at Southern, but in um, baseball in the Black community is tremendous. Um, With Deion Sanders um, and all of the attention being, you know, given to HBCUs, do you think that'll have an effect on the baseball side of things, do you think that we'll start to see a difference in African American players uh, coming? If the, yeah, I think it can't have an effect if the kids listen to their parents. See, when I was coaching, the kids listened to their parents. You got me. In particular, the mother. There was never necessary. The father wasn't always there, but the mothers were, and they listened. And when the mother said, "I want you to go play for coach," they believed it. You got me. They trusted. Mm-hmm. Me. Remember. I didn't have a baseball field I was selling them on. I sold, I sold everything on the hope and the dream. The hope that if you come, things will work out. The dream is we'll have a field. And you know, many kids didn't get a feeling. I felt bad because the system denied them that. Now it wasn't me, the system did. But I kept fighting and fighting and never quit and never complained. My kids will, uh, will, will go off into life knowing when they became he- heads of household, husband and fathers, that they had a mentor who never complained about what he didn't have mm-hmm. and what people to deny him and his kids. Let's find a way to disappoint them was my word to them. Let's not complain. You know, it hurt me when my kids had to change clothes out of their cars in the parking lot and nobody cared other than me. And not, you know, God cared, but you know, God doesn't always come down and speak. You know, we can't visually see him making a difference because the world I live in, justice, when you're talking about justice, justice rides a slow horse. Justice rides a slow horse. And people got to understand that. Justice doesn't sprint. It's a slow horse, you got me? And Mm -hmm. when you look at it, you just got to stay the course. And the 40 years I stayed, I was able to change a lot of things because I had the time to do it. And I always thought about justice. A lot of days I went in there and said, justice rides a slow horse. And and I was basically all upon true, true values. And the fact that justice rides a slow horse. Ricky Weeks. Let's talk about Ricky Weeks. Tell us how you recruited Ricky Weeks, how that went. Obviously, it turned out successfully, but let us know the the backstory there, the coach side of things. (laughs) That was a great story. One of my former players who became a coach for me, coach for me, and I got him a job with Cincinnati, and he, uh, he was scouting in Florida, and he saw this kid, and he called me. And I called Ricky. Well, he, he gave me, and I talked to Ricky's mom, Valeria. And that's the relationship I had with mothers. If, a son, if I could get to mom, I had the kid in most cases. <laughs> if I could just talk to mom. So I talked to Valeria. And then I talked to Ricky a couple of days later. And then I talked to Valeria. And she said, it's something about you. It's something in your voice. 
I got to send my son to you. Now, Valeria was a ordained minister, okay? Mm -hmm. And she said, I have to send my son to you. And that was it. Two conversations, two phone calls. I got Ricky. And the one thing I said to Ricky back in May of 2000, if you work hard, you can be anything you want at Southern. If you work hard, you can be anything you want at Southern. I knew he was a special talent. And the day I saw Ricky, it was over a hundred scouts there. General managers, presidents, cross checkers, all of the biggies in the world were right mm -hmm. there in our And you know what? I was the only one who saw what Ricky had. None of them said a word. I said, this guy's the real deal. Yeah. Six months later, they couldn't believe it. They were all calling me. It can't be the same kid. Yes, he is. He's the same kid. So that's how I got Ricky. It was the easiest, to be honest with you, Ricky was the easiest sign I ever had, to be honest with you, because I didn't have to recruit him. My talking was done to his mother. You got me? That's where my, mm -hmm. I was talking to her. And uh, Ricky didn't sign with me until August before he came to school. So a lot of people had a chance to sign Ricky. You got me? Mm -hmm. But they didn't because they couldn't see what I see. And, and I often say to people, a lot of people are blinded when it comes to see what really is in some people. Okay. But that made a living of being able to see because I had 62 kids drafted, 64, I'm sorry, kids drafted. Eight of them played in the big leagues. And the reason I got so many kids is that I saw something most people couldn't see. I was able, because I remember my daddy being able to see things that I couldn't see. And I often wonder as a kid, how could he, I didn't see that. But he saw things that he would always, <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. So I inherited some of those traits and abilities. And when it came to looking at talent, I could see things. I mean, I could walk in the field. You know, let me tell you a story. I signed a kid in his dressing room, in his, his uh, living room. I said, let me see your delivery. And I signed him. I signed a kid. I asked him to do me three swings. And I signed him. And I signed Blue Moon Odom's cousin in Macon, Georgia. He threw four pitches off of flat ground. And I said, I'm signing you. All of those kids were end up being really great players. Not many people going to do such a thing. They got to see him five, six, 10, 20, 30 times. The world I lived in when I was coaching at Southern, I had to make a decision on the spot. I had to see what nobody else could see. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why I said, I remember I took the, the, the scout that saw Ricky Weeks. We went into Atlanta and there was a tryout. I think the Cubs were doing a trial and it was 50, 60 kids. And we were walking into the park and they were running. And I said, look, you see that kid over there? That's the only kid we need to look at. Why? He said, what? I said, yeah, that's the only kid. And that was the only kid in the whole crew that was drafted. My point was, I didn't see nothing. I just saw the kid, he was standing over there. Mm -hmm. But it's a gift that's unexplainable to people in many cases, you got me? Yeah. Because people want to make it something else other than what it is, it's a gift. Mm -hmm. And you can just see the talent. Like, do you, do you get like a feeling in your gut when you see the talent? So the, like, what's that moment? Does the light bulb come on? Like, talk us through what it's like to be like in that moment when you see a, a potential star or you see a kid who you know has it. I, I don't know. I, it's, I can't, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. <laughs> you, know, it was, I mean, you know, it was another situation. Uh, that same coach who saw Ricky Weeks, who was a scout, he had mm -hmm. signed another kid. And I hadn't seen the kid. And he said, come on, let's go see him pitch. OK. And we get to the park. And uh, uh, <laughs> and we the people warming up. And I said, oh, my goodness. 
Look at that kid on the mound. He said, what? The kid ain't doing that. He's walking around on the mound. I said, that's it. There you go. He's walking around on the mound. But he's walking around on the mound with an air about himself. He said he by 5'8". I said, that's, don't worry about that. I said, he's got an air. That kid goes out and pitched to one hitter. And he said, how could you see it? I said, I can't tell you no more than... You didn't, I didn't have to see him throw a ball to know it was something special about him. I said, because the athletes, the real good ones, the way they walk, the way they carry themselves, says a lot about what you're about to get. And that particular kid who was 5'8", ended up pitching in AAA until he hurt his arm. He would have pitched in the big leagues. And I remember a scout asked him in Houston, Texas, after he pitched. How tall are you? He looked at this guy. He said, how tall you want me to be? <laughs> See, that's the kind. You don't find kids like that. Mm -hmm. You know, struggling. He said, how tall you want me to be? Because he knew it was an issue with being 5'8", but he was a lefty. So those are the kind of things, uh, Miss Taylor, is that I, can, I had the ability, even when I was a basketball coach, I had the ability to see things with, with kids that other coaches couldn't see. Uh, I remember the second coach I coached for under, he had brought in a guy to be the recruiting coordinator. After two months on the job, he called a meeting and said, I made a mistake. He said, I was known as a great recruiter, but this man is better than me because he can see stuff most people can't. And I beg him not to name me the recruiting coordinator because I didn't want that job. Because now keep in mind, here's in most people's case, they would want to do it. This uh, uh they can tuck their chest out. You got say, No, don't do that. You know, and this is how I've been. I never wanted the limelight, even though I've got I've received it. You got me. And I often tell my son, listen, son. When I walk in the place, I'm 6'5". People going to notice me, okay? When you walk in the place, you're 6'3". They're going to notice you, okay? You don't have to make a... You don't have to say anything. Your air, the way you carry yourself once you get in there, is going to say everything you need to be... That needs to be said. You got me? Mm -hmm. And that's the way I've lived the life. And... I've just been fortunate. I was deliver a gift and I finally got to use it in a way that I wish my daddy had lived longer so I could say to him, oh, you had it right. The way you could see things, I just inherited and, and put it into athletics, uh, you know, being able to, you know, I could look at a person and say, man, that guy ain't no good, stay away from that guy. Or that lady's gonna cause you problems, stay away from her. <laughs> You're asking me to talk. That's what I'm saying. Do your thing, I, coach. <laughs> huh? I said, do your thing. I'm just laughing. Like <laughs> You let me do my thing. Lonnie, she's letting me do my thing. Lonnie, do I wish thing. you would She's a dog. <laughs> um, so you've won a lot of games. You won a lot of games, a lot of Ws. Are any of those games like really memorable? Is there one moment that just kind of sticks out in your mind years later? Well, you know, uh, I have to say, normally I don't, but there's one game back in 1987 in May, New Orleans, May 87, when we played the number two team in the nation, Cal State Fullerton. Uh, there was a, the reason the game means a little more is that uh, the guy worked for ESPN now, and I, I feel bad I can't think of his name. He tried to humiliate me. He was a sportscaster in Bad Rudge, okay? And he brought me in to interview him, and he asked me, he said, he asked me some off the wall question. And being the kind the guy I was, I said, the, the thing that I can hope for is that it's 100% humility 
and these California boys come and they go on Bourbon Street and Canal Street and they stay out all night and they come try to play. That's what's my answer to him. But it was an ugly question because my wife was listening and she called the TV station and talked to Bo about him. And I said, don't worry about that guy. Don't worry about that guy. So we go down to New Orleans and exactly what I asked for happened. It was 100% humidity. I could barely survive in the humidity. It was so humid there, it was unbearable. I delivered for me. And we beat Cal State Fullerton, one nothing. But the thing about it, I started a pitcher who hadn't started all year. <laughs> he was my reliever. But he did something else. He did a Muhammad Ali. He said, if they give me two runs, I'll beat them. Oh, my goodness. He told him, <laughs> said, oh, my goodness. I, I, I said, give me two runs, I'll beat them. Well, we only gave him one. And he beat them. You got me? Mm -hmm. So that was memorable. And that guy, to this day, he has to apologize for being it, to be ugly. You see, you can try to be ugly. He said it would be a cold hell. What he said, it would be a cold hell if you all are able to beat Cal State Fullerton. And my wife took it as negative. And I, you know, I just didn't worry about it because people in athletics say stuff. Mm -hmm. you, got me. you have like a duck, let that water run off, you know. Did you deal with that a lot? People um, kind of counting your squad out simply because they weren't, you know, one of the big, big name schools or anything like that? No, it's being HBCU. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you have to be realistic. People, Dr. King, in one of his speeches, said that people wrote in that anything black is ugly, anything white is pure and beautiful, and that's what you have to live with to a large extent. He was so correct in his assessment. When black is really beautiful they found a way to make it ugly and demeaning, you see? And then anything is, uh, uh, associated with historical black school was less than worthy of being in this situation where you could beat teams, you got me? And we beat a whole bunch of them in my coaching career because I never subscribed to the foolishness that they were pretend, perpetuating, you got me? Mm -hmm. And I told kids that, that they were special. They were beautiful. And you're as good as anybody. Do we have all of the necessities? No, we don't. But it won't, it won't keep us from being successful. You know, I'm boring our campaign, our campaign, campaign and stuff. The necessities. We didn't have the necessities. You're too young to know about our campaigners, right? Well, I'm I'm I'm, I'm too young, but I also know I'm I'm gonna go with both. <laughs> oh, you know about the Al campaigners? Yeah, but we want to hear your the, story. The most, go ahead. The most famous word he said to change how black, how baseball was changed for African American when he said we didn't have the necessities to be managers and general managers, and that was the worst thing and the best thing he could have said. You got me. You know, people might say the worst thing, but it was good he said it because now we had a we had something that we could use against people to tear down the wall that was there. And we have seen more and more people, still not enough, but we're making progress, you got me? Mm -hmm. So I made a lot of progress with what I did. And what I did is something that no other school in this whole country, whether they were white, historical black school or what, I sent eight of my former coaches to be scouts, Nobody else has done that. I sent one of my former players to be a major league umpire. No one else has done that. You know, I had the only white player who have come from a HBC used to be drafted and made to the big league. It happened at Southern, okay? I had a Puerto Rican kid. He wasn't the first to make it to the big league, but he made it to the big league. So I didn't discriminate. I, all of them came into the fold. And you know what my white players used to tell me? We love you, coach, because you make the game fun. The white coaches we played for was making the game a pain in the rear. But you make it fun. Mm -hmm. 
because you allow us to play the game and have fun. And that's what they are, kids. And baseball is supposed to be about fun, you see. So I did a lot of things that uh, uh, that other people, I was always thinking about helping people. That's what I, I was always thinking about helping people. How can I help someone? Because I was thinking about future, you got me? Mm -hmm. I only knew it was sort of like Jesus knew he was only going to be on the earth for so long, you got me? And that's why he created the people to go out and preach the good news, you got me? He established them and got them to go preach the good news. I also knew that I had a limitation that how long I was going to be able to do something. So now I had people out in front of me who can carry on and help people mm -hmm. and make sure that it lives on. Not a lot of people thought about it. They were thinking, you know, the, you know what I find out? A lot of them doing coaches were thinking about wins, and I was laughing at them. Really, y'all thinking about wins? I say, you know how many hours I practice? One and a half hours a day, and their eyes would get big. I said, yeah, that's really thinking about winning. Ask my kids how many times we talk about winning. Say so we don't even talk about it. And I said, you know, but they, and I said, this is why we're successful. You know, I said, my kids could leave practice and go go work on a project for, for their class. One and a half hour, we were gone. Not a lot of people did that. They were thinking about winning. Even though you say I won a lot of games, I probably can't tell you how many games I won, but we won them because I had a lot of kids who we prepared to be successful and they didn't want to lose, you got me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't want they wanted to win. Do you think not talking about the wins just removes the pressure to do so and you just go out there and do it? Um, and do you think your players took that to heart? Like, coach isn't putting this pressure on us so we can do this. Well, you know, I did something that a lot of, not a lot of other coaches also wouldn't do. I tried to prepare a total well-rounded kid. I wanted them to graduate. I wanted them to be gentlemen. I wanted them to be husbands and fathers. I wanted them to be leaders in the community. I said, I want you to be a well-rounded person. And when you produce a well-rounded person, you got a better quality person you, them people have to be. Your opponents have to be, you got me? And they mm -hmm. can put things in, they could, oh, I heard thundering outside, I'm sorry. But they had to, they had to try and beat what I was doing, what I was doing was putting something that was hard to beat because they were well-rounded in all phases of what it took to be successful in life, the game of life. That's what made my kids more difficult to beat. Not just the baseball, you see, because you know you're going to fail seven out of ten times. But I was preparing them for everything that life challenge present in front of them. Um. When, when you think about all the years that you have been in baseball, um, whether as a player, a fan, a coach, is there anything that you wish you had done? Is there, is there anything that, you know, you, you still have yet to do that you would like to do? If I, one thing, and I talked about financial things to him, but if I could do anything over again, I would have brought in more financial advisors to talk to them rather than just me talking to them about financial reform, fiscal, how they could, I would have brought more financial advisors in because you know what? That's in my mind. That's the one thing I really regret that I didn't do, didn't, didn't bring in the professionals to do that. I brought in a lot of people, but for, you know, for African-American maker, they got to, you got to get your finances in order. And, and that's the one thing I, th I think about quite often. And I wish that Southern would say to me, come and talk to our kids and teach them and help them and talk about it. Because not only would I talk, I would bring other financial people in so we could help. And the thing is, education is a powerful tool. This is why black folks would deny education for so many years. 
It's so powerful. You can make great decisions. And my thing is, if Southern would understand what I can bring to the table, if we can educate the kids in the, in the process of giving back, making money and giving back, Southern would benefit for hundreds of years in the future. And that's the one area I think if I could do it all over again, that's, the, you know, I fell a little short there. What other, I mean, you, you had people come in and talk to your ball players. Were there any other kinds of life skills that you were teaching? Well, I, I thought I taught them all the other life skills, <laughs> but I, I just thought that I should have brought in some, rather than me talking about finance, and I've been relatively successful with my financing, mm -hmm. but I could have brought somebody else in. That's all I'm saying. No, yeah. I brought in other people to talk about other things, and I missed the boat. We're imperfect. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it. Remember, I was a one man boat for, for a lot of things because I need to say something. All the coaches I hired, they were my former players, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I had to tutor them. You know, they didn't give me the money to hire real coaches, so I had to take my players who eligibility was up and make coaches out of them, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's, so, you know, I had to do a lot of things with fundraising. I raised a lot of money for Southern. That's how I built the baseball field and, uh, and the clubhouse. I raised all the money, so, you know, uh, but I could have done a better job with that, that phase of it. I just missed the boat there and, and, you know, I feel bad about it because I had some brilliant kids there and they're doing good, but they could have done better, you know? Mm -hmm. But I, a lot of them now and I, we talk finance and, and, and we talk about how they can invest and do stuff. You've been elected to three Hall of Fame. What's that like? I mean, I know you didn't set out necessarily with the goal in mind, I'm going to be a Hall of Fame coach, but three, that has to feel tremendous. Well, it, to a lot of people, my family is more. But the last Hall of Fame I did, and I told them, you know what? I don't think I can take this honor to the bank and get a million dollar loan. <laughs> you got me? It was meant to get a laugh, Miss Taylor, okay? But it's true. <laughs> Take the Hall of Fame honor to the bank and get a loan. Would you agree? Agree. Okay, yeah. So it has its limitation. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it says that I was very successful in the profession that I did, that I was in, and we did a lot of good things. Warned me being a Hall of Famer, you know, based upon all of the good things that I did. But, uh, you know, and it is what it is. Uh, if I had gone into this to try and be a Hall of Fame, I would never have achieved that. All of that happened because I didn't care. I was just trying to help my kids, my players, my boys. And uh, they were special to me, I'm telling you. They were really special because when I fussed at them, they understood I was fussing. And then five minutes later, we were hugging each other. You know, and that's the thing. It wasn't a prolonged angry anger mm -hmm. I miss relationship you see what I'm saying yeah. you know we were building relationship and if you get angry at someone and you hold grudges you can't move forward and you know what my former player said to people coach don't hold grudges guys see they could say that to them because they know I didn't and you know how many people can't let grudges go they want to hold them you got me mm -hmm. you can't Grudges against young people because they're going to make more mistakes than all the people. You got me? It's just the process of maturing and, going and, and, and learning. You're going to make mistakes. So you can't hold grudges. You show them love and move forward. Um, we were talking a little bit ago about you being able to like see it in people. Are there any current day players, any present players in the league who you look at and you're like, that guy's got it. That guy's, that guy's a star. Uh, Brandon Phillip, you heard of him? He played in the big league for about 15 years. You heard of Brandon Phillip? Mm -hmm. Brandon played with Cincinnati second base. 
played with Dust under Dusty Baker. At 12 years old, his older brother played for me, okay? At 12 years old, uh, I told his daddy, uh, Brenda go play in the big leagues, 12 years old. And his daddy eyes got bigger. He said, how could you say that? Well, I said, when I came to sign Jamil, I came early. You had a batting cage in your backyard and you had a basketball goal. Brandon came out, he shot basketball, went in and ate serves and came back and hit on the batting machine. I said, you know, nobody had to tell him do that. He did it on his own. But I said, beyond that, it's just something about he's going to play in the big leagues. And when I saw him, when I saw him years later, he said, how did you know? I said, it's easy. It's easy. It was easy. He wasn't easy. Coco Chris, the same thing. Coco never played for me, but I signed him because he wouldn't go to class. And he doesn't mind me telling him, you know. Mm -hmm. I told him Coco, Coco is going to play in the big league. And he played 15, 16 years in the big league. So, I mean, those are the kind of guys, you know, because they were small. A lot of people would never have imagined that they would play in the big leagues because they couldn't see. They just saw small kids. I saw more than that. You got me? Coach, I'm going to see and if anyone. I want to say something else. Go There's for a it. kid playing basketball, probably been in the league 12 years, named uh, Temple. Uh, he's, a, he's playing with the New Orleans team. Uh, uh, Temple is his last name. Oh my goodness, kill him. When he was in the 10th grade, he was playing with Big Baby and a lot of other guys that were really good players. And uh, and I saw him and I told his dad, I said, he had his older brother was a great player at LSU. I said, oh, this, no, this young boy is going to be the better one. He said, man, he's just a little skinny. I said, yeah, but he's going to be the better out of all of them guys. <laughs> And he's still in the league. And, you know, not only is he, not only is he a great NBA player because of the things he brings to the table, he's a leader. He helps people, you got me? But I mm -hmm. didn't know all of that. I just had the opportunity to see him in the lobby before they went into a gym and I picked him out. How could that happen? That just doesn't happen. You got me? Mm -hmm. I hadn't even seen him do anything, to be honest. He was just, they were in the lobby about to enter the gym when I told that to his father. You know? And uh, it's just, when you have it, you have it. You got me? Yep. And that's the best thing I can say. If you have it, you got it. And, and I've had it. And I just not with baseball, but I, you know, with basketball. And and like I said, when I coach basketball, the coach after two months brought a guy in to be the recruiting coordinator. Got rid of him to bring me in to be the coordinator because he realized I had it. And I never want to brag on myself. And I'm getting too much too much into myself right now, Miss Taylor. I don't want to get that. But the but point, the, the point of tonight is it is about you, coach, though. It's 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 oh. about you. So maybe, maybe just tonight you don't have to be so humble. Oh, oh you're good. You're good, girl. Just tonight, <laughs> huh? <laughs> just tonight. You see, I gotta call Lonnie and tell her, your girl made me talk about myself. <laughs> <laughs> She's actually watching. Oh, my um, goodness. We're getting some questions for you in the chat, Coach. I'm going to read them to you, okay? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, William wants to know, how do you encourage American Black athletes to choose baseball when the NFL only requires two to three years of college before the big money? Kutch is famous for choosing football at U of Miami before he hurt his knee for this reason. Well, uh, William, all I can say is we got to have coaches in the little league in the community the way it used to be. And we got to teach them. If we do that, we're not doing that. So they ain't never going to choose baseball because baseball is so much of a, a failure sport. 
and it's so difficult to play. They got to play at a young age with good coaching. Let me just, you can't just put any coach out there. You got to have a coach who knows what he's doing. He's got to give the kids the correct information. So when they fail, they don't look at themselves as failures. They look at it as a process of the game. Kendrick would like to know, what would you consider your best SU baseball team? Wow. That's pretty good, tough, Kendrick. Because in the 80s, I had some really good teams. In the 90s, really good teams. You know, the 90s probably, even though I had Ricky Weeks and them guys, and I, I need to say something. In the 90s, there were 10 championships. We won eight of them. Eight out of 10. Okay. And and then when Ricky and them came from 2001 to 2004, we had 24 kids drafted. That's just a phenomenon. And we had the best winning percentage in all of Division One during that period of time. So it's just to show you that uh, it's hard to determine and you don't want to leave people out. This is the problem you have when you start saying who was the best. They all were good. The 80s team were good. The 90 teams were good. The early 2000 teams were really good. So I don't want to leave them out. <laughs> um, this one's from Mary. Is it purely, is, I'm sorry, it purely about playing ability or does well-roundedness in terms of personality and values factor into the it? Oh, Mary, you now nah, you asked the right question. <laughs> Only a woman <laughs> can do that, Mary. Listen, I really think it's really what makes it happen. I just don't want a kid that's just a good player. You go fall short because there are other things that you see. See, people just look at what happens on the field. When in reality, it's beyond the field because they got to be a citizen. A person, you got me? Mm -hmm. And when finding this plays a part in that, because you don't want a guy to be a good player on the field and then he does something crazy off the field and he brings a lot of embarrassment to the team and you lose him, you got me? So I, I want the kid that's well-rounded, that can uh, fit into any society and be uh, an asset. From Perry, Perry Barber. Hi, Perry. Um, who is the umpire coach? Sorry, who is the umpire you sent to the big leagues? What position did he play for you? And how did you recognize his umpiring abilities when he was playing for you? He was a pitcher. And, you know, his dad and I played together, uh, ironically. And uh, his dad sent him to me because of that. Now, obviously, he came when I had a ton of ability ton of good players and he recognized that so what I did I said hey I need you to umpire these games the scrimmage for us mm -hmm. and did it he did it with joy he understood and when he graduated I said listen uh you're a pretty good umpire I'm gonna make a call get you an umpire in major league baseball minor league so I made the call and they gave him a scholarship to go to baseball school and in four years, he was in the big league umpire. Isn't that beautiful? His That's name amazing. Damon Beal. He went to the big leagues. Marlene is asking, Coach, did you work with any women ball players? Did I worship any? Work. <laughs> did oh, you work with on, any women ball players? Did you work with any women ball players? I have not worked with any women ball players. No, I haven't worked with any. No. Okay. And I, uh, I probably would have loved to. I probably would have loved to. Yeah, that's that's awesome to hear. Karen is her follow up with that is actually what advice would you give to women? I'm assuming that would be women in baseball. Uh, the thing I would probably give them is that, uh, you know, understand the limitation that exists and stay within the parameters. Don't try to do too much. And the most important thing is to have fun. Have fun. Unqua 
uh, would like to know with everything that's gone on in the country, what have you treasured most about your mentorship of black student athletes? Are there any moments that stick out? Oh my goodness, there's so many moments that stick out. You know, we know there's a lot of things going on in the country that are not healthy for our country. But, you know, I think that the players, the people that have been impacted, understand that they have to stay uh, firm, they have to stay smart and still do the things that are gonna make the America a great country, not the foolishness that we see taking place. Anybody have any other, oh, there, oh, the questions are coming coach. <laughs> uh, do you think it's good for young athletes to play multiple sports young and does that help them become better baseball players later? That's from Jordan. Jordan, I think that's a good one. You see, what is happening in today's society that didn't happen when I played, kids are getting burned out. Okay, so when you play multiple sports, I think it keeps them, it makes it better for them, you got me? Because now, you know, if you play baseball all the time, you, you know, it's not fun anymore. I think you have to play multiple sports and keep them fresh. Even Major League Baseball is recommending that kids play multiple sports. To keep you, uh, keep, you, keep you going, keep you energized, keep you fresh. Anybody else have a question for Coach? You got some good listeners there, some pretty good Yeah. Questions. Ooh, this Robert. is from Rob. Yeah. <laughs> How do we encourage more younger black athletes into baseball instead of football and basketball? Well, I think this is where the parents come in. You know, I, I had, the, uh, I had the, the, uh, the privilege of being on uh, the commission of Major League Baseball Diversity Committee. And I can't talk about all the things we talk because of you know, you have, you, you can't talk about everything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, but the things that, that did come out of it is that parents got to realize football has its benefit, but it also have a lot of long-term damage to the kids. Where baseball have its benefit and doesn't have as much long-term damage to them. You see what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I'm thinking that if parents can get their kids into Little League with good coaches, I, I want to reemphasize the importance of good coaches because if they get good coaches at a young age, they will learn the fundamentals and it'll make it easier for them to deal with the failure aspect that baseball presents. Allison is asking, do you think changes at the NCAA level like name image likeness deals will help HBCUs with recruiting players? I can't answer that. I can't answer that. I think Coach Sanders, uh, Coach Prime, as he preferred to be called, uh, is doing a good job. And I see what Gramlin is doing a good job. Uh, but I can't say what is going to happen. I just think it's going to be a revolving door with the transfer portal, okay? Because what is going to happen is that historical black schools can just sit back and wait when they, every year, the big schools going to bring in 25 recruits, okay? They got to push 25 out. Somebody got to leave because they only can have X number, you got me? And kids want to play, so they'll, they'll trickle down to the HBCUs. And, you know, and they could find a home and get better and enjoy the sport that they want to play. Um, Mark would like to know, do you still watch baseball? And what levels do you enjoy? I watch more pro than college now. I haven't, since I retired, I hadn't seen a lot of college baseball. Uh, but I watch professional baseball. And... Uh, not as much as I used to because, you know, before the pandemic, I was doing a lot of traveling and doing all of that. So 
you know, but I do like the game of baseball and I'll be involved with in it at the major league level with uh, major league baseball. I will be involved with it. Over the past several decades, some schools have shut down their baseball programs. What is the future of baseball for HBCUs coach? That's from Peter. The reason they have to co co shut them down is gin equity. When gin equity came into play and finances became an issue, you had to have, you know, and the one thing that the NCAA did a poor job of was with football. Women don't play football, okay? They should have taken football and stick football in the place by itself and then base all of the other sports based on gender equity. You see, as brilliant as those people are supposed to be, how could they do that? They only hurt student athletes by putting football into the equation when women doesn't play football. So my thing is if they had done baseball with basketball or softball, men and women basketball, golf and tennis, all of those things women play, it would have been more fair to everybody. You got me? Mm -hmm. So now when you put football in there, you got to have an extra number of scholarship for women. You got to get rid of some of those ba uh, uh, baseball and tennis and golf. Those are the sports that's going to suffer because they don't have the dollars to make scholarship go anywhere. You got me? Yeah. And that's really what it's all about. You have to understand the, uh, what, what caused schools to, uh, to shut down their baseball program is the fact that, and, and it's not just HBCUs. They've had some historical white schools that shut them down too because they had to be in compliance. You have to be in compliance with the NCAA. Gary would like to know, did you have a relationship with anyone at LSU? Any included, yeah, they, Skip Bertman and Paul Manieri? Yeah, I have relationship. I mean, yeah, I have relationship with people all over the world. <laughs> and certainly in Baton Rouge I do because that's what I'm, I built everything I do on relationships. You have to have relationships in order to build something good. How much do you rely on analytics and how much is on it? That would be from, I'm going to guess Tara. <laughs> that analytic thing is a mess, but I, <laughs> I understand. I truly understand analytics because it's a part of baseball now. And even my last four years of coaching, analytic pay, played a part in, in the things that my coaches were telling me we had to do it. And I, okay, just do it. I mean, you know, I'm old school, but you know, because I did everything prior to that based upon instincts. You got me? What I know my pitchers gonna do, my, what the hitters can do, what my fielders can do. But analytics have taken all of that and put it in a whole different ball game. You know, they rather fail with analytics than succeed with, with instincts. So that's what's going on. That's an interesting and analytics. Analytics is here to stay, by the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I actually like what you just said, that they'd rather fail with analytics. Uh, I'm going to think about that later. Camila um, would like to know, what do you make of all the talk that baseball, MLB, is dying, and that baseball is boring, that it's too slow? Do you agree? Are there any rules you would change? Well, yeah. Baseball does have because of the changing in the in your in your uh, the people your 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 clientele, you know you 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 years ago people didn't mind if it was slow they didn't have a lot to do but nowadays you can't have three and a half four hour games people don't you know they got things they do they have families they got stuff that they want to do so uh, they are changing some things with the 20 second pitch count and, and uh, they want to, uh, in the minor leagues, they want to do the robot umpires and they would, I mean, just putting the main on second base if it goes into the extra inning in the 10 inning. So there are a lot of things that they're trying. You don't want to kill the nat the natural part of the game, but you got to do something because of your clientele. 
they want the game to be faster and you got to call more strikes in my opinion. And that's what I think is the issue. If you call more strikes, you can have the game go quicker and you make that clear to the people in spring training that we're going to call more strikes and we're doing it at the, uh, at the advice of uh, the commissioner office. We got to make our fans happier. You got me? Now you can't call a pitch six inches off the plate a strike, but you, a pitch two inches off this plate could be a strike. You got me? And I think that's one way you can really help move the game forward. Walking nine pitches, nine hitters, batters, it's not going to help at all. You got to be able to eliminate some of those things. And it's amazing, uh, Miss Taylor, that speed is using an asset, but speed slows the game down. Isn't that amazing? Let me tell you how. If a guy's on first base and he's a speed that can steal a base, what does the pitcher do? He throws over five, six, seven times. And it's amazing because of his speed, he ended up slowing the game down. Isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. Most people think of it that way. You got me? Where speed is an asset to the game, it also can slow the game down. If you have a heavy leg guy on first base, nobody's going to worry. They're just going to throw to the hitter. But speed does slow the game down, and it's amazing that it does happen. Levante, who is um, a baseball coach himself, he runs an organization here, coach, called Lost Boys. He would like to know, do you think a modern version resurrection of some sort of the Negro Leagues could re-energize the love and increase the Black community's participation in baseball? That's a pretty good one. I did something nobody else had done. I bought... Negro League uniforms. And we played a Negro League game every year versus Grambling. And everybody came out because it was a beautiful situation. And we brought in Buck O'Neill before he passed away. And he was so impressed because he could see the Negro League come alive again because we had uniforms from every city that they had a team in like Pittsburgh and Cleveland and St. Louis and Memphis, the New York Black Giants. And oh, it was on and on and on in the Kansas City Bardock. So we had them. And I think it's a great thing. But you know what? I'm, I'm a little disappointed when I retired. Those uniforms has been sitting, nobody want to do it. And they don't understand how important the history, the history of the Negro League was because the Negro League made it possible for them to get a job. The abuse they took made it possible for us to be able to get good jobs, okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Coach, what's on the horizon for you? What are you up to in retirement? <laughs> like I said, I'm still, I, I hadn't been as busy because of the pandemic, but I do do some satellite thing with MLB. Uh, I do speak to groups every now and then. And, uh, you know, I'm on a couple of boards and I do stay busy. I do a lot of Zoom. <laughs> are you, uh, are you talking to, are you talking to any kids? Are any of the like, you know, Little League teams reaching out to you at all? Not, not, I've only spoken to one team pre-pandemic, none during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. No, I, you know, that's one of the things I'm going to do. I'll talk to kids in high school, junior high. So I do do that. You got me. But because mm-hmm. of the pandemic, the same, you got me, you know, and I'm hopeful that this, you know, maybe by the spring, we can start to get this thing under control. And, you know, I start doing more things there and, uh, you know, uh, you know, we can make some things happen. Now, this will probably be my last question. What advice huh? would you have for aspiring coaches or baseball players? Wow. Well, if you're going to be a player, you have to play, learn the game and play the game right. Okay? 
try to learn the game the correct way. And as coaches, you need to go to, to clinics and try to learn the game to coaches the right way. Because if you know how to coach it correctly, you're going to have more success and you'll help more kids. So each have to go and learn it. On, on, I didn't have to do it because I played it all my life. But there are things changing in the game today that coaches need to learn to do because of the way kids are being taught. You need to know how they're being taught because they're going to tell you, well, they taught me this way. So you need to be up to speed on what people are teaching these kids so you can best help them. Does anyone watching have one more question before we, before we say goodbye? Anybody? I don't want to leave. I'm having fun. Hey, we can, I mean, let's, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's uh, hang out, coach. Um, oh my you goodness. know what, coach, let me, let, no. let me ask you this. Do you have a team that you watch right now? Do you have a favorite team? Not really. Uh, you know, Dusty Baker and our friends, uh, I do watch the Astros, you know, but it's, okay. you know, it is what it is. But I wanted to show you something. Okay. My book. Uh, oh, let's see. There it is. There it is. Against, there it is against all odds. You can, you know, you can go to Amazon and get it. It's a really good read. You can find out more about me and you'll see how see, I kept life really simple coming out of a very difficult situation. And it's really not bad. You know, and then you see, if we could see Dusty Baker on the bottom, he talk, well, we can't see it on the bottom, but <laughs> Dusty does say something about me on there, so. You know, that's awesome. So there I'm going I'm, I'm to pick it up and then I'm going to text you and ask you questions. OK, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know. there it is. Uh, but well, no, the good. I really. Oh, somebody else want to say something. I or think they're just saying, saying thank you. No, they're, they're, they're just saying oh, thank they are you. Beautiful. Yeah, I wish I wish I need to find out because I do a TV show and I, we don't do we don't take call in, but. I really wish we would because it's a very popular show. I've been doing this 16 years. Couldn't survive if it wasn't popular. Would you agree? Coach, where can we find your show? Is it online? Is it on social? What channel? Go to YouTube. Go to YouTube and look for Roger Kador. Okay. It's, well, thank you again, whole, Coach. You, you this. All right. It's a pleasure. I thank had more you. fun than 10 years together. In one <laughs> hour. How about how and I'll tell Lonnie, I'll tell oh. Lonnie how good you are. Thank you. I mean, I appreciate you being gentle with me as a rookie today. I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> you did um, good, girl. Thank you. Keep it up, okay? Thank you. Tell appreciate the guys it, I coach. said hello. Okay. Right, and bye. Be, be, bye, Coach. Before everyone else goes, I just want to remind you that you can get your early bird discount for the Sabre Analytics Conference. It expires tomorrow. So make sure you sign up and join us on March 17th through the 20th as we bring together the top minds in baseball analytics for this unique online event. Register today, you know the address, sabre.org. So I, I wanna say thank you. Thank you so much to everyone for the messages, for the questions, for the text messages. For our first ballpark figures, you were dope. This was dope. And I want to remind you next month, the first Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern, me and Jessica Luther. I, I know you're happy about that. <laughs> Thanks again, y'all. Have a good night. <laughs>